Hello, hello out there. Welcome to our Ed webinar, actually our first K through eight coding and robotics community webinar for this year of 2019. Um, it's called Beyond the Basics, Coding with Conditionals and Variables. My name's Dylan Porterlance. I'm a product manager at Wonder Workshop, a children's robotics company in San Mateo, California. And then with me, I have Katrina Keen. You want to introduce yourself, yes. Katrina? Hello, hello. And I already see some people introducing themselves in the chat. I saw Peggy. Welcome back, Peggy. Um, and some other familiar names, too. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm super excited. We've been awaiting this for, for several weeks now. I um, absolutely love uh, being on here and joining with Ed Webb to do these webinars. So I am Katrina Keen. Um, I, too, work for Wonder Workshop. I'm an, an uh, Central Region Outreach Manager. And uh, however, I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, so I get to travel out to California to, to see the team quite often. Um, again, thrilled to be here. I am a, a former kindergarten teacher, first grade, third grade, sixth and ninth grade uh, computer teacher. I also taught coding for a few years uh, in grades nine through 12. Um, also taught coding for a year at the college level as well. So um, I was also a tech director and now with Wonder Workshop and uh, again, thrilled to be here. And then we wanna let you know about the coding and robotics K through eight community on EdWeb. It's free to join at www.edweb.net slash code. Some of the things you can do there, view all of the different recordings, um, this one and the past ones that we've done for the last few years. You can earn your CE certificates there. You can download the slides and the chat logs so you can see the different discussions that folks have had. And there's tons of free resources there as well. So whatever you're doing in education, if you're interested in coding and robotics in K through eight, make sure you join this community. Um, we already introduced ourselves, so I'm going to move on. Actually, I, I need to tell you a little bit about what I do. So as a product manager at Wonder Workshop, um, I actually work with several different folks from engineers to designers to folks that are writing curriculum and content um, to make sure that we're creating products that are, that are working in the classroom, um, whether that's in kindergarten all the way up to eighth grade using our robots. And I have actually some robots here. We've got Dash here, um, and we've got our robot Dot. And then, oh, Katrina's got her dash too. And then we also have our Q robot, um, which Katrina also has right there. <laughs> <laughs> so all our friends are here. The title of the webinar is Beyond the Basics, Coding with Conditionals and Variables. So we'll be getting a little bit beyond some of the early foundational computer science concepts and getting into some of the later ones. But first of all, we want to hear who are you? Some of you have, have introduced yourself on the chat. But who are you, where are you from, where are you from, and what is your role in education? Are you a classroom teacher? Are you a tech integrationist, a coach, a principal, library media specialist? We want to know. Awesome. So I see Maya from NSW. Is that New South Wales teacher librarian? We've got folks from Florida. <laughs> I like this one. Laura AP, overall nerd. <laughs> awesome. Media specialist and art teacher. Public library assistant, very cool. Got some folks from Hawaii. I also am curious, any kindergarten teachers on here? Oh, I saw there a pre-K. I always ask, no. I started as a kindergarten teacher and I just, that's, it's my heart. So I love when uh, uh, teachers are on here and they start early with coding. Instructional leadership, cool at a university level. K through four technology facilitator. Got some paraprofessionals, awesome. Any special education teachers out there? South Dakota. OK. Computer science teacher for pre-K through second grade. Love it. Yay. OK, awesome. We've got a lot of people here and a lot of different kinds of teachers. Yeah, special ed. There we go. Business teacher from Chicago. Cool. So we, we believe that we'll have um, a presentation that will work for a lot of you. We're going to be delving into kind of the why of computer science, um, talking a little bit about some of the foundational concepts, and then we're going to be showing a ton of examples, whether it's unplugged or using robots, <laughs> to be able to practice these coding concepts and also introduce them into your classroom. So I'll let Katrina right. take it away. 
Yeah. So we're going to start with some, did you know, some facts about uh, coding, some early coding, just coding in general, K-12, um, and how you can help your students and really be in the mindset early on of where coding is taking us. So some of you, I bet, did not know that the majority of schools don't actually teach computer science. Um, and, and those of you that are in this webinar with us and, and on this chat with us, um, I would maybe speculate that you are one of the, the first ones in your school to really hop on this coding train, and you may have for the last few years, but a lot of the schools, they don't teach computer science. It's not a requirement, but one of the interesting facts is 90% of parents want their child to study computer science. Um, and just so you know, a lot of these uh, percentages and facts and statistics that I'll be going through in these first few slides here, I got from the code.org website. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with code.org, but it's one of my top resources when I'm talking about coding and computer science because they have so many facts and statistics on their website. So I often keep up with it and go back and kind of get their updates. But 90% of parents want their child to study computer science. And I myself am a parent. I have a 12-year-old daughter a 15 year old son and um, my daughter was in the robotics club or she was on the team uh, through elementary school which was so cool and I absolutely loved that she was exposed to computer science at a young age uh, fortunately both my kids obviously kind of get that here at home as well um, so they're my little guinea pigs and my little testers here but um, I wish there was more computer science and coding and robotics going on in their schools so as a parent I can say that that is true Um, <clears throat> however, uh, only 40% of schools teach computer programming and that I hope, I hope that level is coming up that percentage and it has been over the past few years. Um, but it's definitely not a requirement in a lot of states and in a lot of schools. What percentage would you have guessed? Is this higher or lower than you expected? Let's see from the chat. I want to know is 40% what you expected? Is it lower or higher? Higher. Yeah, oh, some lower. Pretty so, interesting. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's a mix. Yeah. Well, and you know what? And I wonder too, if we were to really kind of dissect this, um, it, it really does matter from what I've seen on what state you're coming from. Um, there are so many states that are ahead of the game uh, with computer science and they see it in all their schools and all their districts. And then there's some states that they have just begun with coding and computer science. So quite interesting. So the STEM problem is in computer science. 58% of all new jobs in STEM are in computing. However, only 8% of STEM graduates are in computer science and there's such a uh, kind of a hole, a deficit in students that are prepared to go into these um, jobs and into these degrees. But what we have found is that students enjoy computer science and the arts the most. Uh, and that resonates with me. In fact, I actually started out as a music major in college. I ended up switching over to elementary education, but, um, and Dylan too, right? We both play the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, <laughs> so uh, both of us were, were very much into the arts. Um, I absolutely loved computers. In fact, I have, you know, memories of as, as young as kindergarten. And I was in a school district where uh, very early on we had computers. So all the way down to kindergarten and we would get in our line and we would go down to the computer lab. And it was just the most exciting day to get to go to the computer lab, where, whether we were playing Oregon Trail or, uh, you know, playing number munchers or whatever. Um, but I absolutely loved going to computer class and so on up through school you know it got more challenging we got more into the coding and computer science but absolutely love computer science and, and the arts the most so in just two years what are we going to find out there will be 1.4 million jobs out there and for all the teachers that are on here all the educators that are on here that is very very exciting very exciting however there will only be 0.4 million students 
that will be ready to go into these fields because there is such a deficit, like I said earlier. Um, and so for those of you that are pre-K and kindergarten teachers, um, starting these kids young, starting them on just this exposure to coding, uh, whether that's with robots, whether that's um, unplugged coding, which we're going to get to in a little bit and what that means, um, but just giving them that exposure, starting them young to get them interested it is so important. And uh, something else that we found kind of across the board is that so often Cody does not even mentioned or exposed to students until high school. And by the time they get to high school, they've already chosen kind of the path that they want to go and their interests and, and what they want to do. And so if we can start them young and get their interests peaked at a young age, even starting in pre-K, um, we may be able to fill more of these, these jobs um, with students. So we saw there will be that one million deficit. So hopefully we can, we can uh, continue with our students and getting their interests peaked. So why robotics? Why are we here? You know, why am I even sitting in this job? Why am I interested in it? Um, programmable computers and robots are increasingly pervasive. We see these all over the place. We're gonna we're gonna show you a slide in a few here that kind of shows you day to day things where we see robots. Um, Tangible and hands-on, so real-world challenges. Robots are fun and filled with personality, as we see with Dash, with Q, with Dot. Um, robotics has computational, mechanical, uh, kinesthetic, spatial, auditory, visual learning, and so much more for students. And one of the great things about uh, Dash and Q and robots in general is that we can bring these into the classroom. We can tie them into the things that we are already doing, so our curriculum that we're already working through, and um, really tie these into those things. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a separate set time. We don't have to say, okay, kids, it's time for robotics, or it's it's time for computer science. We don't have to do that. We can tie all of this in and really um, that's where it gets to be so much fun in the classroom. So for all of you out there, what's what's your why for robotics? Why do you care about robotics? Why do you use robotics in your classroom or want to if you haven't yet? What's your why for robotics? Fun. Yeah, that's a good one. We it is fun. It is, yeah. Engagement. Okay. Logical thinking. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely get into some of the logical thinking today with conditionals. Whoa. Ooh, we're seeing okay. some four oh, C's come through. Yeah. Collaboration. Collaboration. You got it. Very engaging and interactive. We're seeing a lot of that one. Hands on. Uh huh. Oh, someone who uses dash and dot. Very cool. And glad to see that it's engaging. The applied robotics of tangibility, yes, hands-on mindset. Fun, awesome, but challenging. Yeah, I like that one a lot. It's fun, but it's also challenging. It is. Yeah. It's challenging for for teachers too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I applaud all of you that are in here. You know, taking on computer science. Sometimes that sounds so scary. You know, to educators, and they think I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. But you know how I started out. I started out with dash right when he first came out actually when he was on kickstarter and i had no clue what i was doing and so i just handed him to my kids and i said uh show me <laughs> teach me and so that's one great way to learn as well let your kids kind of try them out and try different things and and learn from your kids too very cool these are great answers everyone thanks so much for sharing yeah so robotics all around us, and these are great examples of robotics that are happening all the time around us, things that are ha uh, going on that we don't even realize, something as simple as a toaster. And uh, for those of you that are parents or aunts, uncles, and you may have kids over at your house, um, you can even talk with your kids, hey, this is so cool, this toaster is a robot. Um, and you know, when I push the button down, it, it performs a certain function and knows when to pop up. Um, and you can set those to different times. Uh, you know, which we'll talk about actually through this webinar. So, you know, even the, the snack machine, the washer, your dryer. Um, I have one of those, oh, those Roomba, 
vacuums as well. And, uh, you know, I turn that on and it goes all around. It knows when to put itself up. And they're just, yes, coffee makers. Uh, some people are throwing in some ideas here. There's even a drone here. And I know I've got a few drones that I code as well. So cars, and there's a picture of a car. So think about backup cameras, um, different things that are on cars that, that are also, you know, show that robotics are all around us. Legos. If you have yeah, ideas, what other, what other kinds of things? <laughs> yeah. When you think of the robots that are out here in the world, these are the kinds of things that we love bringing up in a classroom so that kids can really think about all the different ways that robots apply to the things around them. Robotic surgery in a hospital. Very cool. Yeah, we're going to see more and more of that. I know as years to come. Welders and assemblies who are doing all kinds of different tasks. Traffic, Traffic light. light. Yes. One of, that's one of my slides. Yep. Okay. I love it. Cutters. Very cool. <laughs> so yeah, like Dylan said, th these are fun to talk about with, with your students just to kind of show them that they're all around us. Drone photography. Love it. Yeah, you could just put a camera on that drone on the slide, huh? Okay, cool. Self-driving cars, dishwashers. Dishwasher. There was speaking of dishwasher, there was a meme on Facebook uh, a couple of days ago that said, Don't we wish we could just tell Alexa to do our dishes or something like that? <laughs> or Google Home. And I thought, yes. <laughs> Very cool. Cool. So um, our scope and sequence of the curriculum that we have called the Learn to Code curriculum for Dash and Dot at Wonder Workshop. Um, is actually aligned to code.org's curriculum using these six foundational concepts of computer science. So those concepts are sequencing, loops, events, conditionals, functions, and variables. And two of the ones that we see over and over that some folks struggle a little bit more with um, are conditionals and variables. So that's why we decided to make this webinar focus on those two concepts. Um, but Katrina, let's review a little bit about some of these earlier concepts just so folks are refreshed. Yeah, definitely. So um, I always think of sequencing, well, looping as well, but sequencing starting in pre-K and kindergarten. And one of the things that I that I often refer to is I think back to when I was in kindergarten and we used to have those old worksheets where you would cut out, you know, step one, step two, step three. So in the morning I get up, then I you know, brush my teeth, then I go to school and you would have to cut them out and you would have to glue them onto your paper. And that's what sequencing is. It's basically just saying, you know, what's going to happen first, second and third. And um, really, that's what coding is all about. And so we introduced that even in kindergarten, pre-K, K, really first grade on up into second, depending on um, how much exposure your students have had uh, with coding. Um, same with loops. So telling a robot to, you know, perform that function over and over again um, uh, is something that we can start early on as well. Same with events. Um, and then on up into what we're talking about today. So conditionals and uh, variables, I would say when we've got it labeled here, code.org does starting really in third grade. Um, however, that varies. So oftentimes I tell teachers when they're looking at the scope and sequence from code.org, just know that your students are your students. You know them, you know what they've been exposed to, and you could start these later or you could start them earlier depending on where your students are at. And one of the cool things about computer science is that these concepts aren't really isolated. A lot of times you're taking some of the earlier concepts and then you're actually combining them to create more complex programs or more complex computational thinking. So it really varies. I mean, sometimes you'll be sequencing on your own, but then you will put a sequence inside of a loop. Sometimes you might be doing functions and conditionals at the same time. So these concepts really don't, don't work in isolation. And we'll actually look at a few examples today of using variables and conditionals together. So let's talk about conditionals. So the way that we define conditional, instructions that depend on whether something is true or false. And this really starts with the notion of a condition, which is that thing that can be true or false. So I think actually Katrina was talking a little bit earlier about her morning routine. Um, but if you want to take your morning routine a step higher, a step more complex from just doing a sequence, doing things in order, um, you might add a conditional. So you might say, if it's raining today, I'm going to wear a rain jacket. Or if it's some other kind of weather, I might pick a different outfit. Um, I saw that someone in the chat earlier mentioned a traffic light. Um, so we have a traffic light example here. And a traffic light 
really has three conditions that you're supposed to pay attention to. And it's kind of programming the driver. It's programming the person to interpret that light and understand um, what they're supposed to do when they see those different lights. So if the traffic light is red, you're supposed to stop, you're supposed to stop. If the traffic light is yellow, you're supposed to slow down. And if it's green, you can keep going. This is just an example of a conditional with three different conditions. And those conditions are traffic light is red, traffic light is yellow, or traffic light is green. And then the execution or the step that happens for each of those conditions is the stop, the slow down, or the keep going. We'll come back to these vocabulary, this vocabulary as we see some of these other examples. So really quick, we're gonna show, or actually I'll have Katrina introduce this video. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm good friends with um, a, she's an instructional technology coach. She lives in Alabama. And I say good friends, um, which is kind of funny because I met her on Twitter. Um, and we only see one another at conferences, but it feels like we're, you know, really good friends. So when I found out that we were doing this webinar, I reached out to her and um, she's one of our Wonder League uh, coaches as well. So she coaches a whole group of students and uh, is a part of the Wonder League, which if you're interested is, is on our website with uh, makewonder.com. But uh, so Faith is so into coding. She's she's just amazing. So I asked if she would make just a short video that explains conditionals. And what I love about this video is she gives us uh, real life examples and how she addresses this concept with her students. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let me get this started here. Hi guys, my name is Faith Plunkett and I'm an instructional technology coach in Alabama. For the past four years, I taught computer science and video game design at the elementary level. Um, conditionals can be really hard for students to understand, but what I tried to do was try to provide as many world examples as I could. Code.org has a fantastic activity that my students loved. It's an unplugged activity that involves cards, or you can even make colored pieces of paper if you don't have a deck of cards. So for example, they can play war, and if they get a blue card, then they get five points. If they get a red card, then they get 10 points or blue or black or whatever your card deck looks like. Um, each color will have a different point value and it helps them understand if I get one thing, then it will lead to another. If I hit this, then I will get this many points. Um, for my younger kids, I try to pair it with weather. If it's summer outside, then I wear this. If it's winter outside, then I wear this. It does get a little complicated because I do live in Alabama, so we don't necessarily have four seasons, but it helps them understand, hey, if it's cold, if it's winter, I need to wear a coat. Hey, if it's summer, then I need to wear shorts and flip-flops. Another thing I did with my students was have them program games on Scratch, um, and they loved to do that. So we would often involve variables and points and time limits and everything. So if the sprite touched the edge of the screen, then it would reset. Or if the sprite touched the ball, then it would get a point. Or if the sprite touched the ghost, then the ghost would disappear. So those are just some easy ways to incorporate conditionals and variables into your computer science curriculum. Let me bring the presentation back. Okay. So actually what we have here is a, a bit of a variation on the activity that, that she described. Um, from code.org. So this is just a way that you can start doing basically an unplugged, no, no device version of a conditional in your classroom and really help kids understand, you know, the decision making process and how that relates back to computer science. So this example is just a simple game where you draw a card, maybe you take turns. Um, and if the card is red, you get a point. Otherwise, you get two points and you can play some number of turns and then talk about um, what decision you need to make and how you know who gets points and then relate that back to the coding skill. And then, of course, conditionals can be, you know, as complicated as you want them to be. So, for example, earlier we were talking about a really simple one where if it's raining outside, you put on your rain jacket. That's just one condition and one result. Um, but oftentimes, conditionals will have many conditions and many different kinds of results and decisions in a program, like the traffic light, which has three. This one is a little bit different than the traffic light. This one is saying not only if, but also else, which means if you draw a red card, you're going to get a point. Otherwise, if you draw a card with a club on it, you're going to lose a point. 
And then the else basically says for any other result that you get, for any other card that you draw, you're going to get two points. So else basically means otherwise. For all the other things that can happen, you're going to get two points. So the two conditions are red card, card with a club, but the conditional covers all the different cards that you can draw. And I crossed out sample program for early readers because I wanted to share this one. Um, just to really drive the point home, you can make these as complicated as you want. This is from an actual student that we met um, when we did this activity. Uh, and it can be fun to write a conditional that, that has a little bit of creativity to it. If the card is a spade, but not a three or a seven or a jack, you get one point. If the card is a diamond, you get two points. And if the card is the queen of hearts, so only one of those cards you get what is it, 10,000 points? That's a lot of points. <laughs> so it can be really fun to, to, oh, excuse me, and if the card is anything else, you get zero points. So there, so there's certain conditions um, where you get no points. But this can be fun. You can, you can make this as complex as you want. Um, but it really gets into that logical thinking because you're thinking about um, whether something is true or false. You're thinking about um, using the word or, so it could be a three or a seven or a jack. Um, and it kind of combines all those conditions. And then you can also think of an and, meaning it has to be both of these things at once. So it really gets into all those components of logical thinking. No, and I think, I almost think those card games would be really fun for like a station in the classroom or a center. You yeah. could almost, I, if I was back in the classroom, I would probably get my kids one of those little green, not to promote gambling, but one of those little green <laughs> gambling hats, you know what I mean? Like cards when they're playing cards, put them in a center and they would absolutely love that. So they would take off with that and they're learning at the same time. So they would think that was so cool. Super awesome. So this is a video that Katrina found. Do you want to tell our folks about yeah. this video? For sure. For those of you that are familiar with vocabulary, um, when I was prepping for this webinar, I came across this uh, vocabulary video that talks about conditionals. And uh, I loved it so much. I messaged Dylan. I'm like, we've got to put this into the webinar because it really, it explains conditionals, but it also shows how fun and cool coding can be. So I'm, I'm excited to share this, this video with you. Many coding languages, but all programs run by following basic instructions like do this, then do that. If this is true, do this. If it's false, do that. The order in which a program carries out instructions is called the control flow. You can manipulate the control flow with conditional statements. You know what I'm talking about? So let's get into it. Y'all ready? Conditionals. Uh. Conditionals are statements that only run when certain criteria are met. Uh -huh. And to see if they're met, conditionals, they tell a computer to check. The computer and to see if a condition is true and to do an action if it is. And if it's false, do a different action. Do you get the gist? Where do you find conditionals? In games and sites in daily life, yup, day and night for real. Imagine if your mom someday is like, if you wash my pickup truck, I will pay you like 20 bucks. Uh huh. The condition that has to be true is washing the truck. Washing the truck. And if it's true, then you get paid up. That worked well. Uh -huh. If the condition is false, there's another part called the else. Called like the else. when your mom says or else, you're not going to the mall. That's the else. It happens when the if condition is false. So if you don't clean the truck, mom looks to the else for the other action. Uh -huh. You don't go to the mall. There's mud on the Chevy. No satisfaction. Uh -huh. You can code conditionals too, that's what programmers do. Uh -huh. Bet your mom wishes she could program you when you don't do what you told to do. Yeah. Conditionals tell a computer what to do if a certain condition is true. If a certain condition is false, there's a different thing, yeah, that's all. Conditionals tell a computer what to do if a certain condition is true. If a certain condition is false, there's a different thing, yeah, that's all. Let's write a conditional. So much fun. I love it. The video goes on to explain a little bit more about it, but you kind of get the idea. So uh, again, if I was in the classroom, we'd be dancing to that video. So <laughs> you can make it so much fun. 
All right, so we actually have a video of one of our products at Wonder Workshop, which is called the Learn to Code Challenge Cards. It's 72 different cards that each have a unique individual challenge with scaffolding for students, starting with basics of sequencing for programming our robots dash and dot, all the way up to using conditionals and variables. So this is in particular a conditional challenge card that we want to show. And basically the way that it works is you'll program with a conditional um, based on what dash senses with its proximity sensors. So in other words, it can detect your hand or something else like that. And then it's going to move based on that condition. I think folks can't see the video, so I'm going to try that again. There we go. So these videos you can actually find on our Wonder Workshop YouTube channel. There's several different cards where we demonstrate how to write a program in Blockly that addresses it. Oh, Katrina's got the challenge cards right there with her. So you can actually see what they look like almost in person. Yeah, um, yeah so um, we've, we have you know all kinds of curriculum, online curriculum. We have a, a bound book full of curriculum, and then we've got the challenge cards that, that support that curriculum. So like Dylan said, um, it starts with, with level A, goes all the way through level F, which coordinates with code.org. And what's fun about these, um, as you saw from the video, you can take one of these, and let's say your kindergarten students are working on you know, sequences. You can take one of these and give it to a, you know, a center or a group of students, and then they can work on the challenge that's on the back. Um, so you can give them one or two or however many you want, but depending on what they're working on, um, these coordinate with those. So if you can see, I don't know if you can see, I pulled one that's uh, for conditionals and I pulled one on uh, variables. So it tells at the top uh, what they're for and then gives a challenge on the back. And they're also um, wipeable. So for those of you that have younger students, you know how important that is so you can clean these off and um, they're wonderful. Awesome to hear from uh, Ashley West from Kansas. Yeah. I have these cards in my enrichment classroom. Love them. Students can work in small groups at their own pace. That's really cool. We're glad to hear that. Um, so another thing that I have to show here is a little demo that we have. So besides the Blockly app, which we've been showing you with the block-based coding, we also have an app called Wonder. Has anybody ever heard of our app called Wonder by any chance? Hey, we got a few people who have heard of Wonder, some people who haven't. That's okay. You bet. Woohoo. All right. So I have an iPad here, and I think you can see that if I hold it up close. Maybe there's a little bit of a, of a mirror image. But what I have here, and you don't worry too much about the details, but you can kind of see the structure of this program that I wrote. And this is a program that basically has one simple decision or conditional. And the cool thing about Wonder is you don't actually have to be able to, to read the different instructions or go from top to bottom, but you can actually see um, visually the decision that a robot is going to make based on some input. 
So in this case, I have um, two different kinds of input for the robot. I have if it sees something in front of it, or if it has a button, if, if, if it senses a button press on the top of its head. So I'm actually going to turn my screen to, is our friend, everybody say hi to Dash. I'm going to turn him on. And then I'm going to connect. Look at the screen, Dash. <laughs> okay, so basically the way that this program works, if I press the top button, it's going to, what is it going to do? I need to look, actually. It's going to fall asleep. But if I put my hand in front of it, it's going to wake up. So let me just do a quick play. So it's asleep right now. Or actually, if I hit the button, that's Dash falling asleep. But if I run the program again, and this time I put my hand in front, it's going to say hi. So that's a really simple example of the way that the Wonder app works. This is just another way that you can visualize the concept of a conditional. So it really shows on the screen the different decisions that a robot can make, um, and then the results by a traceable path. There's a quick demo with Dash. Let me go back to the presentation. Let's talk about variables, the other topic of this webinar. So a variable is a placeholder or name that represents a number or some other value that can be referred to in a program and oftentimes changed. And that's probably a, a more formal definition, but a way to think of it is you can use a variable when you need to keep track of something or you need to remember something. Like, for example, the number of times that something happens. Um, for example, in that last program, I, maybe I could have changed the program a little bit so that it kept track of the number of times I pressed that button or the number of times that it sensed something in front of it. Um, another example of where you might need a variable is if you're programming a game. Um, so just like uh, our friend Faith was talking about um, where she has her students create games in Scratch and she teaches conditionals by having them have their sprites sense when they reach the edge of the screen in a game, you might also have variables that you're using to keep track of things. So you might, for example, keep track of scores to the game. Um, the different players might have a different score. You might keep track of whose turn it is, so a variable that, that alternates between two different values. Or you might have a variable that keeps track of how much time is left so that when the time is up, the game has to stop. So these are all things that, as you're coding, you might have to keep track of or remember or refer to later. And a variable is what you use to do that in your programming language. One of the things that we do um, in our curriculum for Wonder Workshop is actually introduce the concept of variables with a little bit of an unplugged activity called dash and dot libs. Who's, who's used Mad Libs before or is familiar with, with the game Mad Libs? I know Katrina is. Anybody a fan of Mad Libs? Cool way to, to um, integrate it with English and language arts learning. So basically, each of these little boxes that you put a word in can be thought of like a variable, because what that box is going to do is keep track of what you inputted. And then when you're ready to read the whole dash and dot lib from the beginning, um, you still have a place where you've kept track of that, and you can read the story fluently. And there, these words can be coming from many different authors, whether one author is doing the verbs or another author is doing the locations, or you can mix and match it. Um, but it's a great way to introduce the concept of variables and holding on to information. I'll do uh, it. Dylan, before you, sorry, uh, before you go on, you mentioned that that was an unplugged activity. And I know for some of our uh, viewers here, they may not know what unplugged means. Oh, yeah. Uh, so right. just, yeah. So I just wanted to touch on that really quickly. So unplugged uh, just means that exactly what it sounds like, you're unplugging from basically technology. So what Dylan just showed is essentially a worksheet. You could put that into a station. You could do that at the guided reading table, actually, if you wanted to with your students, for, for those of you that have younger students, and fill in those together. Um, and you notice that first blank says verb. And like Dylan said, of course, you're teaching um, lots of things besides just coding, but you're unplugging from the technology. And I grabbed a few examples today of some unplugged activities or 
products uh, that you could buy that are on the market. This one I've had for a couple of years. This is called Little Coder. Um, and all it is is these little cards. And they're still packaged up so they don't fall out. I take these to a lot of conferences. Um, so you'll see this one says turn left. This one says step forward. And so really this is an unplugged uh, game or activity that your students can do and they can code each other. So they can say, I want you to step forward, you know, this many steps, or I want you to turn right or turn left. Um, this is also fun to do on a parent night when you have parents coming into the classrooms and one of the activities that they can do is to code their parents. Uh, so that's a new concept for a lot of parents. Um, and so they love to see that their, their kids are coding and also that they're a little, you know, a bit away from technology and learning still how to code, but away from the screen. Another one that I wanted to show you, this is from a, a friend of mine named Laura Fleming. She came out with uh, something called hands-on coding and kind of the same concept of the cards only you have blocks here that you put together so they stack on top of each other you can lay them on the desk and so you can say when um you know when you want to do this move forward um, and you notice there are conditionals here so this block here says if then do this else do this so it has even these uh more advanced blocks but you could do simple ones too like this one says move forward uh when blank key is pressed do this this is a repeat block uh but these are great for uh stations or centers in your classroom again you can clean these uh they're not going to break you can drop them um and so i absolutely love this product as well again this is called hands-on coding for ages five plus that's awesome. And the really cool thing about those, because they're tangible and manipulatives, is you can even create your own kind of makeshift DIY versions in your classroom and empower your kids to, to add on and think about all the different things that they might want to add to that instruction set. I also saw yeah, that Nick sure. from New Zealand uh, posted some unplugged, unplugged excuse me, activities from csunplugged.org. So that might be a worthwhile resource checking out. Any other uh, unplugged activities that folks out there on the chat use in their classroom. We'd love to hear. We've got yeah. unplugged, capture a prince and, pr ooh, a prince, a princess and bag of precious gems to enter the castle in a Google Doc, very cool. <laughs> That's awesome, thank you, Naomi. Yeah, what, what's cool about this is you don't even have to spend any money. Like these products are amazing and they're already made and everything, but you can make your own for free. So you can just make, you know, move forward, turn to the left, turn to the right, and you can do these on paper. And then you can do one of my favorite things, which is laminate them and cut them out and, and use them in your classroom. So I miss those little things about teaching, like laminating. <laughs> cool. So um, I have a quick demo of variables for Dash. So I'm actually going to go back to the Blockly app this time. So back to block-based coding. And let me just show you what my iPad looks like really quick. So this program, can everyone see right there? OK. So this program has two variables. And one of the interesting things that we did here as we designed Blockly is we actually used fruit to represent these different numbers. So ordinarily in a programming language, you would have to come up with a name for your variable. Maybe you would use a letter like X or A or B, or you might say something like length or distance if it's a unit of measure. But at Wonder Workshop in Blockly, what we do is we use fruit. So you can just use these little icons to refer to different numbers. Um, so at the beginning of the program, what you're doing is you're setting your variables to zero. And what the, the or and they're actually the orange and watermelon. So what the orange and the watermelon are going to do is they're going to keep track of two different things. The orange is going to keep track of how many times I've pressed the top button of my robot dash. So there's a button up here and it knows when I pressed it and it's going to start keeping track of that. And then the watermelon is going to be used to keep track of how many times I clap. So what I call this program is a special special wake up trick. So what you'll see here is that the way that we've written the code, first of all, we'll start those variables at zero. Then um, every time dash hears a clap, I'm going to make the watermelon go up by one. And every time dash feels me press the top button, I'm going to make the orange go up by one. And the way that dash is going to wake up is if the orange 
ends up greater than 10 and the watermelon ends up greater than zero. So in other words, I have to clap at least one time, but I have to press the button at least 10 times. So let me do a quick demonstration of that. So we've got dash right here. And I'm gonna start the program. So if I just, whoop, let me move from right there. So if I just clap, oops, one second. So if I just clap, you'll notice that where the watermelon is, whoop, the watermelon now says one, which means that it's sensed to clap and actually it's thinking that my voice is a clap too. So it's not gonna wake up, but because it's waiting to see if uh, the number of claps is greater than zero and the number of button presses is greater than 10, if I start pressing the buttons, I'm gonna start making my orange variable go up. So I just hit it about seven times, it still hasn't woken up but you'll notice that the orange is a little bit higher. And if I clap one more time, it still won't wake up. But as soon as my button presses reaches 11, there it goes, now it's woken up. So that's just a simple way that you can use variables. Maybe the program itself isn't as simple, but the way that you can actually use the different sensors and the different things that Dash knows about to actually count and to keep track of something. We also have a quick video here. This is some students talking about um, how variables work and how they might apply to the robots as well. So let me play this. I'm Wally. And I'm Mimi. Welcome to the Dash and Dot Show. Today we'll be showing you all about variables. A variable is a placeholder. You can think of it as a bag or a jar or a cup. Whatever's inside is a value. Today I'm going to program Wally. Wait, why me? There you go. So, I have a glass. The glass is the variable and the marbles are the values. I'm going to program Wally to toss Dot. If I put two marbles in the glass and start the program, Wally will toss Dot twice. Whee! Whee! See? Now I'm going to add three more marbles. And now Wally's going to toss Dot five times. That's enough of that. Your turn. I'm going to program you. Wally, have you lost your marbles? Hello? Hi, Mimi. This is Albert. I need a little help. I was trying to explain variables to some of the other toys, and I got stuck in this loop. Wow. You just can't catch a break. Sorry, Wally. I gotta go. One of our friends isn't as smart as we think he is. It's okay. Oops. Yep. So that's just another way that you can demonstrate variables by actually programming another person, um, whether it's a cup or a jar or whatever. Um, you can count the number of things that go into it, and that can be thought of as the variable. So I mentioned this earlier, but this is a close-up. Um, most folks, when they encounter variables in an educational setting, um, the first place that it shows up is in something like algebra and math. Um, but what we've actually done with our Blockly app is we've taken these abstract letters that are often used for the first time and actually changed them to fruit so that they're a little bit easier on the eyes, a little bit easier to grasp, um, and then you have, then you can refer to the number of times that you've been tapping Dash's head or it sensed you based on oranges, pineapples, lemons, and watermelon, so a little bit more fun. And on the right side of the screen, these are the different blocks that you actually have available to you with regards to variables. So the things that you can do with variables in Blockly are change them by some number. So you could add two to your variable or add one or subtract one. Um, you can set it to a number like zero or 10. 
Um, you can actually use your variable to drive a certain distance. So maybe you set your variable and then you count it up and then you immediately drive that amount. Um, so you could, you know, add energy or add gas to your robot um, car and then have it actually drive off. Um, and then you can also, as I said before, combine variables with conditionals. So one of the great things about using variables is that you can actually check the value of a variable. Um, so earlier when we were talking about conditionals, like if it's raining outside, um, put on your raincoat, um, you can actually use a variable instead, meaning you could do something like if it's above or maybe if it's below 30 degrees, I'll wear my warmest coat. Um, so then you're actually checking a number like the temperature and then making a decision based on that. And then Katrina, this is uh, one of your favorite challenge cards. So this is the magic dot ball. Um, the way that the magic dot ball works, it's kind of like a magic eight ball. Um, and what we do with our what we do with our variable is we set it to a random number between one and eight. And then what we do is we create a conditional that says if it's the value of one. So we set a value random one to eight. So maybe it's a one, maybe it's a seven, maybe it's a five. If it's a one, dot will respond one way. If it's a two, dot will respond another way. So I have the solution here. On the left side is the full solution, but on the right side, we have a zoomed in one so you can see it a little bit better. So we set the orange to a random number between one and eight. And then for all the different numbers that we could get out of one and eight, we have a different response from dot. So dot might say maybe, it might say yes, no. And the orange blocks that say my sounds, those are actually sounds that can be recorded by students. So they can pick up their iPad, record a five second clip, it'll, it'll pitch their voice up a little bit, so it'll sound a little bit funny in the robot. Um, but then they can play Magic 8-Ball with their own responses. So it's a great way to get students kind of using their creativity and putting their own voice in their program. Um, so I actually have uh, a demo of this program. It's a slight variation, actually. I have a slightly more indecisive dot, so there's a few more maybes than yeses and nos. Um, but let me really quick connect to my dot robot here and then find my program. Dylan, while you're doing that, um, mm -hmm. one of the cool things is, um, and up on your screen you said, you know, that you provided the solution. One of the cool things is, you know, even about the challenge cards is there's not always just one solution. Yeah. And so something, yeah, something that I always like to do is if I provided these cards for my kids, I always like to come back as a whole and have them present to one another their solution that they found and, you know, why it might have been different or how they got to that point or whatever. So um, you can learn a lot just just from that and teaching one another and reflecting back on on their program that they created awesome cool so I've got my dot here I've connected and to do the magic dot ball let's just do a quick test to make sure that it's making sound whoops I'm gonna go with no so that's the no and let's see if I hit it again if it'll make I'm a different gonna one go with Maybe. Ooh, it tricked me. I thought I was going to say no again. So let's have a uh, let's have a question from the chat. A yes or no question. What do you want to ask the magic dot ball? What quest? What yes or no question do you have for the magic dot ball? Will it? Will schools be canceled from all the snow coming to the Midwest and Northeast this weekend? That's funny. I'm seeing a lot. You predicted exactly what people were going <laughs> to. I knew teachers will be thinking that. I'm going to go with maybe. Maybe. It sounds like we'll never know. Thanks, Dot. <laughs> okay, so the other thing is when we use variables and conditionals in programs, um, it creates a, a new dynamic. It, it creates more complexity, but it also creates more fun. Um, you can create different choices that the robot can make. You can also add randomness. There's a lot of things that you can do once you have these tools in your toolkit for creating programs. So this is just a fun video of some students um, trying out a program with Dash where they had Dash be a what we call a troll of trepidation. And they made a program with conditionals and variables, and then they reflected on how they were using that program. Um, to have folks play a game with Dash and try to figure out how to remove all the lights from, from its face. So I'm going to play that video for you. 
Dash was the troll, and we had to defeat him, which was sad. We didn't want to. Look very sad. Well, um, variable. It's something that replaces a number. So in this or a letter. Yes. Maybe letter. Yeah, something. Something. So in this case, it was a watermelon. <laughs> In the beginning, he set the variable to zero, so zero cracked means he's fine. And then as we kept on rising the variables, it, his power was lowering. And we could just use the variables easily to just say when, when like, watermelon equals one, then one clap, turn off, turn off four lights. And then if the if we clap two times, then it would turn off four more. And then when we clap three, it would turn off more. And, and then, then he died. died. It was so sad. He tried to prevent. It was funny, it was really funny. to see, to be able to record the sound play. Like, you just the flesh moved. I'm okay. And then my favorite one was, I'm getting weaker. Help, please. please. And then he died. And then there was another one that said, you shall not pass. It's just an example of all the fun that you can have with coding with conditionals and variables. All right, so we want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Um, I'm going to pull open the audience questions really quick. Is there a cost for the Wonder Workshop cards that you just shared? You can find all of the different Wonder Workshop products on store.makewonder.com, um, and you can learn more about our education solution at makewonder.com slash classroom. Um, the Learn to Code Challenge cards are there that we've been, that we've been showing. So. Any other questions from folks? You can put them in the audience questions section. I saw that someone asked how old those students were. So the, those students are in fifth grade um, and fairly new to coding. I think they had they had spent maybe a few weeks in fourth and fifth grade playing with dash and dot and coding them. So if there's no more questions, um, I do want to make sure that we let you know if you are coming to either FETC in Orlando, Florida, um, January 27th through the 30th, Katrina and I will both be there at booth 1511. Please come visit us. Um, she will also be at TCAA uh, February 4th through 8th in San Antonio, Texas at booth 1225. So please come by. We'll have a ton of different demos of all our different robots and some of our new products that have never been seen before. Um, as well as all the different things that you can do in your classroom. And a lot of folks from Wonder Workshop will be there to answer questions and to help you get what you need so that you can be successful with your students and your teachers. Again, we're Wonder Workshop. My name is Dylan Porterlance. Katrina. Yeah, real quick. Yeah, we had a couple questions come in here. Oh, um, oh, what age would you recommend to use the robots? Um, we recommend uh, Dash and Dot, so the blue ones, um, from really kindergarten through fifth. You could do pre-K as well. Um, and then Q is written really primarily for sixth through eighth grade. However, we have a lot of students that are using Q in fourth and fifth, depending on if they have been exposed to a lot of coding um, in really kindergarten for second grade. Um, and then, you know what is funny, when I taught ninth through 12th grade coding, we did not have Q at the time. Q wasn't even out yet. And I brought Dash into my ninth through 12th graders and they thought he was so cool. They had never been exposed to block coding before. They had never visited code.org. Um, and I brought him in and they had a blast with him. So again, you know your students um, and what's going to work best. Um, we do get a lot of questions, you know, what's the difference between the two? Uh, Q is more advanced. Q has more sensors built around. You can also convert your block coding into JavaScript so the students can actually see the code that they're writing, which leads into more advanced coding, especially when they get to high school. Um, so you can explore these on our website at makewonder.com and just learn a little bit more about, you know, the differences between them. But um, that was a great question um, on which robots to use. Fantastic. So again, we're Wonder Workshop. You can find us at makewonder.com slash classroom. We're also on the social media at Wonder Workshop on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Teach Wonder, at Wonder Workshop on Instagram, and Pinterest.com slash Teach Wonder. And then for the folks from EdWeb, please join the community at edweb.net slash code. Thank you so much, everyone. And we left our emails in the chat. You can feel free to hit us up if you have any more questions, and we'll be around. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.